So good morning and good evening, everyone, and welcome to Suta in the City, coming to you live from the shores of the Hudson River in New York City. It's great to spend another morning and evening with you to share the good news of the Dhamma. So we have an epic evening for you that will begin with an incredible heavenly battle. The Clash of the Titans. Yeah, well, quite literally. But before that, we have a poem. Now, if you were here Thursday, Stephen had picked a poem from a very uh, quite vaunted Canadian writer. What was her name? A Zwicky? I don't remember her first name. Jan Zwicky. Jan Zwicky, a very famous Canadian poet, very famous. Um, and so I thought, you know, I really, really, really like this poet. But I was thinking, let me find a poem written by her. However, I couldn't find, because I haven't bought the book like our cultured Stephen has. So I, I didn't have any poems that I could get for free. However, it appears that her husband too is a very famous poet uh, in Canada. So I found one of her husband's poems. And so I thought, why don't we, why don't we read that? And, you know, maybe there's somewhat of an answer to her poem, who knows? But I, I thought it would be just fun, just an all around fun thing to do. Um, so again, this is the poem of uh, the husband, the husband of the great Jan Zwicky. And it's called These Poems, she said. So here we are. These poems, these poems, these poems, she said, are poems with no love in them. They are the poems of a man who would leave his wife and child because they made noise in his study. These are the poems of a man who would murder his mother to claim the inheritance. These are the poems of a man like Plato, she said, meaning something I did not comprehend, but which nevertheless offended me. These are the poems of a man who would rather sleep with himself than with women, she said. These are the poems of a man with eyes like a draw knife, with hands like a pickpocket's hands, woven of water and logic and hunger, with no strand of love in them. These poems are as heartless as bird song, as unmeant as elm leaves, which if they love, love only the wide blue sky and the air and the idea of elm leaves. Self-love is an ending, she said, and not a beginning. Love means love of the thing sung, not of the song or the singing. These poems, she said, you are, he said, beautiful. That is not love, she said rightly. So I kind of liked it. As I said, this is the husband of the great Jan Zwicky and his poem. What I liked about it, because um, I sort of fantasized that that was her reaction to some of his poems, you know, how sometimes these literary teams, they are sort of like each other's editors. So I kind of liked that notion. But what I really, really liked, I'm going to share it again. What I really liked about it is after lambasting and lambasting and saying all these terrible things about the man who would write these types of poems. He didn't say, get out of here. I don't want to hear you anymore. He said, you are beautiful. Um, and then, of course, she had a, an answer. That's not love. Um, and he said, she said rightly. But I just really like that after all of these criticisms, he was able to respond in a way that I thought was quite nice and charitable. You don't think he was just trying to flatter her? Well, he, yeah, he might have. Maybe he was one of those men who was like, let me just say something nice so that she'll stop talking. That also could be possible, but I wanted to take the charitable view and say, wow, you know, it's a great response to all of these criticisms. He found the one thing that, you know, that he could say positive 
Uh, it's sort of like the sutta, the, the sutta that we were reading um, Thursday, you know, where you see the individual um, who has been mean to you or said unkind things, but then you dive into a lotus pond and you swim beneath the muck and the moss and the that, and you get this sweet drink of water, right? You find something um, nice about that individual. So I kind of looked at it from that lens. That sounds like they have a very interesting relationship. Uh, I would say indeed, they must. Um, they must have a quite the interesting relationship. I would like a mirror into that to be sure. But moving on from the relationships of famous literati, why don't we move on to tonight's uh, sutta, which has also got poetry in it, which is nice. The poetry of the Devati. The Devati, I love it. So uh, Stephen, why don't you set us up with what's going on as I look to share this sutta? Well, this sutta takes, it's, it's out of this world because it takes place in a heavenly realm of which the Buddhist texts speak of many. And in this sutta, we are told, or we're, we hear about two kind of heavenly beings, creatures, non-human beings of a refined nature, devas and asuras. And it's said that they were constantly fighting constantly at battle and so I mean, one might ask but if these are heavenly people why are they fighting battles aren't they kind of blissed out in meditation and thinking lofty thoughts and the answer is apparently not and so it turns out that even if one is in this deva realm for instance and of a very refined nature where you only eat some kind of special ambrosia food and you don't eat regular human being food and you're you don't really get born like we do in this painful way you still have lots of issues to work out <laughs> just like us and so the devas and the asuras are said to be constantly battling it out and we're told about the two leaders the leaders of each of these groups, um, Vipachati, the guy who's in charge of the Asuras, and then Saka, Lord of the Devas, who resides in a place called the Tavatingsa Heavens, sometimes called the Heavens of the 33. And they have this big battle. And of course, there's a winner and a loser, and we'll read about that. So it is interesting to note that um, they seem a lot like regular people. <laughs> Although they are these lofty place uh, residents, they actually seem to act a lot like um, you and me. Yeah, uh, that's always disappointing to hear when there's others who act like us, but so be it. Um, we will need um, some readers. So if you can please raise your hand. And uh, once again, um, okay, great. We're getting volunteers. Fabulous. Star nine for those on the phone. And for those of you who are joining via computer, uh, it, the hand raises and the reactions. Okay, very good. So it looks like we have Gita and Suan and Ken. So, Gita, would you start us off, please? Hi, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. Can you hear me? We can, Gita. OK. Um, so translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi, Samyutta Nikaya 11, Connected Discourses with Saka. Four, Vipasati, or Patience. At Savitri, the Blessed One said this, once in the past bhikkhus, the devas and the asuras were arrayed for battle. Then Vipasati, Lord of the Asuras, addressed address the asuras thus, Dear sirs, in the impending battle between the devas and the asuras, if the asuras win, the devas are defeated, bind Saka, Lord of the devas, by his four limbs and neck, and bring him to me in the city of the asuras. 
and Saka, Lord of the Devas, addressed the Tabatimsa Devas thus, Dear sirs, in the impending, impending battle between the Devas and the Asuras, if the Devas win and the Asuras are defeated, bind Vipasati, Lord of the Asuras, by his four limbs and neck and bring him to me in the Sudama assembly hall. In the battle, in the battle Bhikkhus, the Devas won and the Asuras were defeated. Then the Devas bound Vipasati by his four limbs and neck and brought him to Saka in the Sudama assembly hall. When the Saka was entering and leaving the Sudama assembly hall, Vipasati, bound by his four limbs and neck, abused and reviled him with rude, harsh words. Then Bhikkhus Matali, the charioteer, addressed Saka, Lord of the Devas, in verse. Thank you. When, so, okay. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Gita. So now we're going to begin thank in you. verse. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have two conversations. Um, we're going to have a con one conversation with two people, Saka and Matali, the charioteer. And we're going to first hear from Matali. And I believe that Suan is our next reader. Hello. Hi, Suan. Hi. Okay. When face to face with the Vipachati, it is Magava from fear or weakness that you endure him so patiently, listening to his harsh words, Saka. It is neither through fear nor weakness that I am patient with the Pachati. How can a wise person like me engage in combat with a fool? Matali. Fools would vent their anger even more if no one would keep them in check. Hence, the drastic punishment the wise man should restrain the fool. Saka, I believe I myself think this alone is the way to check the fool. When one knows one's foe is angry, one mindfully maintains one peace. Thank you. One's so, peace. Thank you so much, Suan. Mm -hmm. So Sokka's response is, if someone's angry, keep it chill. All right. <laughs> Next up is Ken. Matali, I see this fault, O Vasava, in practicing patient endurance. When the fool thinks of you thus, he endures me out of fear. The dolt will chase you even more as a bull does one who flees. Saka, let it be whether or not he thinks he endures me out of fear of goals that culminate in one's own good. None is better, is found better than patience. When a person endowed with strength patiently endures a weakling, they call that the supreme patience. The weakling must be patient always. They call that strength no strength at all, the strength that is the strength of folly. But no one can reproach a person who is strong because guarded by Dhamma. Thank you so much, Ken. And next up we have Duncan. And we're starting right here, Duncan. He, pray, he one who repays an angry man with anger, thereby makes things worse for himself. Not repaying an angry man with anger. One wins a battle hard to win. He practices for the welfare of both his own and the others when, knowing that his foe is angry, he mindfully maintains his peace. When he achieves the cure of both, his own and the others, the people who consider him a fool are unskilled in the Dhamma. So, Bhikkhus, if Saka, Lord of the Devas, subsisting on the fruit of his own merit, exercising supreme sovereignty and rulership over the Tavatamasa Devas, 
will be one who speaks in praise of patience and gentleness, then how much more would it be fitting here for you who have gone forth in such a well-expounded Dhamma and discipline to be gentle, patient and gentle? Thank okay. you so much, Duncan. And thank you to all of our readers for this evening. That was great. We had just the right amount of readers. So thank you for that. Wow, well, there was an awful lot covered in this poem, really, this beautiful poem. Um, so. Um, what do you think, Regina? Does it sound easy? Like, uh, you know, I have to wonder, you know, it's always, it seems to me, it's always easy to be patient and kind when you're on top. Well, yeah, we had spoken about this before. Um, of course, it, it, it really, really is. So, I mean, in a way, I'm kind of like, crying a bit foul on this sutta it's like well you know um Saka it's not like you lost and you had to be patient you know and he was tied up um <laughs> but but what I find interesting though what I do um what I found interesting was this whole notion it's like okay if I don't strike back uh, if people are going to think I'm not striking back because I'm fearful or they're going to think I'm striking back because I'm weak or I'm not striking back because I'm weak. Um, but uh, what I really liked that what he brought forth was, as a matter of fact, it's the strong person who is able to contain their impulsive, I would say, nature to respond in kind. And it's much harder. And I really like this line. Um, where is it? Uh, um, one wins a battle hard won. I, I don't know the exact quote. Matter of fact, I should probably memorize that, that line. You know, not responding in kind. A person wins a battle hard won. But I also wanted to talk about this whole notion of um, patient endurance because there's two qualities there. There's a whole idea of one being uh, maintaining a sense of patience and also this sense of enduring. And I think that these are really key concepts in how we deal with our emotions. So um, being able to be patient with anger, what does that mean? That means that I don't strike out the minute you, you know, that you call me a fool. And I'm like, well, you know, you're stupid. You know, it's like I, 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 I pay, I'm patient with my internal feelings of being called names and I allow it to stay within me. I'm able to endure this. And so therefore I'm able to respond in a way that's in accordance with the Dhamma. So um, I really, really find that to be key. I also find, um, I found what was really key was that when a person is angry, you maintain a sense of peace. Because I'm gonna ask you guys, this is an honest question. I really, when has it been, when has it been when any of y'all, and I'm asking this for myself, have been in a situation where there's argumentation and you notice voices get louder and then this gets louder and then this gets louder and then this and then the language is harsh and it gets harsher. But when does it ever benefit anyone? When has it made a bad situation better when responding in kind to anger? And I think for me, almost never, almost never. So um, yeah. Those are my those are my thoughts. Uh, you know what I think is interesting about the verses is that it's not between the winner and the loser, which is probably what we might expect to read. You know, the guys marched in in chains, face to face with his victor, and we get this kind of heated exchange. But that's not what we see. We see a, a discussion between the Lord of the Deva Saka and some other deva, Matali, right? Some kind of random third character. Right, right, the charioteer. The charioteer, which is interesting. And so they seem to sort of stand in for two kinds of approaches. And it's 
I think it's really interesting. The first stanza sets up Matali's mentality because he he asks, well, why are you so patient? Is it because you're afraid of him or because you're weak? So he can't really imagine something outside of these two reasons at all. Why else, in other words, he seems to be asking, are you patient? How else, for what other reason could one be patient? And so Saka, of course, immediately responds with the answer. But um, it seems like a very difficult discussion, right? Because I don't think Matali is really getting it. Right. Um, yeah, well. And I think it's, it's very true that in our lives, very often we're patient with people because either we want something from them and we hope that if we behave well, we'll get it. Or we are just afraid of the consequences if we're, if we make that person angry and they're going to do something even worse to us. And I think that sort of third way of behaving patiently because it's just the right thing to do is, is pretty rare in all honesty for it's, many people, for myself too. It is very rare. And um, that in um, relation to what you were just saying, um, he practices for the welfare of both his own and the others. And so it is exactly as you're saying, it's not because, gee, if it, my boss is yelling at me and if I respond angrily, I might get fired or I might not get that raise I want. Um, or if I respond in anger to the cashier, I might not get that 10% off that I'm fighting about because I really want that 10% off. No, it's, a, it's because he's practicing really for the good of both and um, essentially for their spiritual welfare, one would assume for their karma. And it's a totally different way of looking at anger and the dangers of anger and, and the, the karmic stain that anger can leave. And it's instead that it's not easy, right? It says here, not repaying an angry man with anger. One wins a battle hard to win. So right. even Saka himself says this is no simple task, but lofty, something to aspire to. So um, it's, in, it's an inspiring verse. And I think it's important to realize that this is a battle hard to win because if we don't, we might think that we're just constantly failing and not good people. Right. Right, absolutely. And again, um, as has been brought up in uh, sessions that we've met before this, there's been the argument, well, if I don't get angry at injustice, then I'm a supporter of injustice. Um, th this also points to a third, fourth or fifth, or many other different ways of responding that may be and quite probably are more effective. My mind goes to, and maybe some of you here in the States may remember this or maybe not, I don't know. Um, uh, I would guess maybe a year or two ago on C-SPAN where they have call-ins, um, there was an African-American woman who was on the show and a white man called in and he said, you know, I don't want to be racist, but I am because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of black people and they're going to hurt me and I can't help how I feel. This is, this is just how I feel. I'm, I'm scared and that's why I'm this way. And the host didn't respond angrily. As a matter of fact, she responded so compassionately and actually they had an actual dialogue about you know, the rootedness of his fears and where they came from. Um, she didn't disregard him or yell at him. And it, you know, it turned out that they had spoken after the show and had developed this ongoing conversation that was so inspiring to many people who witnessed it and heard about it, that by not acting in anger, she actually changed this man's mindset completely and no doubt many, many, many others. So while rage seems to be the prevailing zeitgeist 
you know, we must be rageful. It really isn't the best form of change, surprisingly, but it's not. And I see Ayavimala has her hand raised. Ayavimala? Um, can you hear me? We yes. can. can. Can patience be the opposite of anger? I, I mean, think is it realistically, or can we can we talk about it as the opposite of anger? Stephen, do you want to address that, or shall I? Why don't you go first? Okay, for me, um, I would say so. I would say so because anger, to me, well, okay, let's look at it in two parts. There's the feeling anger, and there's the response to that anger. So patients would act in two ways in that respect. But um, I'm sorry, there was a loud motorcycle out there. Um, patience as the first step is dealing with what the anger brings up inside and allowing it to happen. And then taking that pause before responding outwardly and to me, patience also connotes this idea of listening, being open to, waiting, not responding. Um, so in that way, I think it is definitely a great antidote. It doesn't mean, though, that one will never feel anger. But I don't know if I fully address that. And Stephen, what are your thoughts on that question? Well, I guess I would say first that it seems like the, the quality of patience would encompass more than just the quality of non-anger, but it, it would also seem to be inclusive of that quality. And it says here, we have this verse of goals that culminate in one's own, own good, none is found better than patience. And so it seems to be almost one of the supreme qualities presented here. Um, so it seems like if you're patient, it's pretty easy to not get angry. So I guess there's a question that I don't really know the answer to that could you be not angry, but impatient? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Aya, what do you think? You're talking to me. I, I'm not sure. I always think it almost reads as if patients were like the perfect antidote to anger or even the opposite, but it doesn't take all situations into account. I think I like this, uh, the very, this that you highlighted, I think that's really good. So patience can be, can maybe be a perfect antidote to a lot of disturbing emotions. Yeah. I think it would tie in very closely to mindfulness or self-awareness and a clear understanding of how things are. And it has a sort of a, quali a patient quality is a, a cool quality. It's not an excited quality. And so when we are patient, we have much better chance of sort of understanding what's happening and not being reactive. Well, I'm glad you used that word because um, patience to me is reflective. It's reflective. It's allowing whatever is out there to come in. And it's not necessarily responding, you know, um, whereas anger or the manifestations of anger are reactive. I mean, I also like the idea that you brought up, Stephen, around impatience. And is it possible to be impatient and not feel anger? And I would argue that impatience is definitely, it's impossible to be impatient without anger. I've never experienced it because it's an aggressive emotion. I always um, kind of qualified that as one of those subtle um, anger things that we often don't recognize. For example, when I used to take the subway to the job that I used to have, I remember when the train would come to the subway stop and I would feel this impatience coming on as people waiting for the doors to open, waiting for people to come out, waiting for my turn to get in, that feeling of impatience, it's anger. 
It is. It's like, when are these people going to get out of the subway? How many people are in there getting off at this stop? When am I going to get on? Oh my God, everyone's getting in front of me. I'm not going to get a seat. So I would, I would encourage people to look at impatience and see if it's something that's occurring because that's one of those low level angers, anger situation that conditions more anger in us and more anger to arise in the future. I would agree. And we have a hand up from Catherine. Catherine? You are unmuted and now you're muted. Oh, there okay. you go. Okay. Okay. Uh, to me, uh, when uh, we say a person is patient, usually he will be a calm person. A calm person when uh, in the face of anger, uh, normally, usually they will not react to anger with anger. So uh, actually, of course, this one, this patients actually will benefit both sides. Um, and anyway, patience is also one of the supreme blessings as mentioned in the Mangala Sutta. So it is a very powerful uh, quality, I think. Absolutely. Thank you. And I liked how you yeah. mentioned and pointed out the idea that it's, it's a benefit to both, right? Because I think when somebody who's angry comes across somebody who doesn't react to them, it's a little bit striking. It's sort of almost unsettling because when you're angry, you sort of are provoking a response. You're, you're asking for a response. And if the person seems composed, calm, even kind, it kind of diffuses the situation very often, immediately. It has that disarming quality. And the person thinks, well, wait a second, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not behaving right here. Maybe I shouldn't be even angry because it doesn't seem like the situation is warranting it. So yeah, it's a great thing. It is, yes. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I see Ken has his hand up, Ken. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of a situation I, I've been as both a parent and, a, and as a teacher where I'm trying to explain something. And I think it's very clear, but the, the you know, my, my child or, or, the, or the student uh, doesn't get it. And, and my, my first reaction is anger. What do you mean you don't get it? It's perfectly clear. And, but, but I've learned the hard way, getting angry is the worst thing in that situation because no learning takes place. So I, I can continue, now I can continue to be impatient, but I re recognize my impatience and, 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 and don't, don't express anger. Um, so anyway, that, that's the situation that I've encountered a lot. Thank you so much, Ken. That's a beautiful thing. And it's true, very little learning happens when someone's afraid that, you know, that they've done something wrong and it, it's, it's very um, stifling. And uh, yeah, thank you for that, especially teaching. You know, I've been a teacher and it's the same thing. And, and then I ask myself, why is it when I'm trying to explain something and the other person doesn't get it? Do I get angry? It's not like they're intentionally not getting it. Um, but it's it, frustration again is one of those things to, to check, you know, because it's one of those, it's so easy to have that crop up throughout the day. So when we become aware of impatience, when we become aware of frustration, when we become aware of irritation, when we have an itch, it's like, oh, why does this itch? Well, heck, just scratch the itch. It's nothing to get angry about. But again, it's these mind states that pop up so unconsciously that once again, sort of, um, reinforce the angry mind state that we that causes us so much pain in our society so much pain i see that uh sue ann had her hand up sue ann um steven can you help sue ann Oh, there she goes. Sue Ann, you're on. Okay. Are you there? Okay. I just wanted to uh, make a comment about um, the correlation I'm finding between 
impatience and anger. Um, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago I have a situation going with my cousin, whom I loved all my life and we've been best friends as well as cousins. And anyway, she got really angry at me at something I did and, and, and just about pulled a cancel culture on me. I mean, like she didn't want to have anything to, to do with me. And I thought I did something totally inadvertent and, and innocently. And of course, my immediate reaction was, as always, to react and get angry. But I'm really trying to practice responding and not reacting and not nurturing anger. So I'm using patience to wait until all the anger subsides so that I can respond to her in a more understanding and compassionate way. But it's really difficult. Um, I thought the anger would have been gone by now. I actually pray about it and meditate on it. And I haven't written to her or called her. And I, you know, I'm really being patient, but I, I can't get rid of that last drop like of anger, you know, because I, I feel so self-righteous about it, I guess you could say. So I'm just kind of telling on myself. I just want to say that's where I'm at with this topic. Um, thank you, actually, for updating. I remember when this came up a few weeks ago, and I believe it was over an issue on Facebook, which, a lot yeah. of, yes, and a lot of y'all know I'm not a huge fan of Facebook, but I, I have to get my account on hat. That said, um, you know, so often when, and it sounds kind of like a resentment, anger type thing. Um, <clears throat> For me and in my experience and, and others, when there's this like this thing that just won't go away, it might be related to an unrecognized hurt. Like perhaps there is, there's a pain there. And I, I think I mentioned this in the last session where our mind is so tricky on us. We are always trying to get away from dukkha. You know, the Buddha said dukkha is to be experienced. Dukkha is to be understood. And the only way, unfortunately, that we can truly get dukkha is to feel it. But no one wants to feel it. And so what do we do? We, we drink alcohol sometimes too much. Maybe people medicate themselves. Maybe people are constantly uh, working. People get workaholism or... Um, or always wanting to go distract, you know, I don't know how there's so many on Facebook, maybe, but it's like, these are the mechanisms that the mind constructs so that we can avoid dukkha. And unfortunately, this, I love this saying, maybe many of you have heard it, but what we resist persists. So if we resist mm -hmm. dukkha, whether it's by covering it up with anger, or with righteousness, or uh, with drinking or, or sleeping a lot, it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to hurt us a lot. And it may end up hurting other people a lot. Um, and so what I would suggest maybe thinking about for all of us who encounter these situations is to open up to the pain of that, let the pain in and then rather than reaching out to the cousin or the friend or the ex-partner, having compassion, self-compassion for the pain in ourselves. And once we can open up to the pain and, and give ourselves compassion for how much being this embodied being hurts, I think then we're on the path to, um, to loving kindness towards that person and ourselves. But until we can do that, really hard to let that go and anger persists well i'm going to just give that as an offering to you sue ann and and let's you know maybe in a few weeks update us hopefully not thank that. you that was beautiful i appreciate that 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 really really resonates with me thank you thank you so much sue ann um and Catherine, i see you have your hand up again uh yes uh i want to say what i learned from this uh uh, Sutta is uh, the benefits of patience and non-violence and of course we learn about the disadvantages of violence and animosity yeah 
Thank you so much. Oh, I just love that you talked about nonviolence. This is beautiful. I, you know, this is what we're striving for in our Buddhist practice and our spiritual life and really in our daily life, nonviolence towards ourselves and nonviolence towards others. I mean, if you ask most people, well, do you wanna be a violent force in society? Most people are gonna say no. But when we um, entertain, nurture and feed anger, it's, it's what we're doing. I hate to say it, not to criticize anyone. I do it too. Uh, Diane, I see you have your hand up, Diane. Um, just a question. Do we know what the battle was about? Apparently the battle doesn't really matter. <laughs> That's the MacGuffin. I don't know if you know what the MacGuffin is. I think it's the Maltese Falcon. It's a classic show. And I think there was like, what was, I don't know. There was a movie that was about nothing that it had anything to do with. It was just part of the plot. I don't know, Stephen, is, do we know why they're fighting? I think they're always fighting. I don't know. Actually, I mean, it's like a thing with them. They're fighting all the time. I don't know the answer, no. Uh, it's not pleasant. Okay, Todd? Uh, yes, I think the Asuras are always trying to get to the top of uh, Mount Meru, up to the heaven of the 33 gods, just to take it over. And that's why they're always fighting with the king of the gods. Wow. Thank you for that, Todd. Um, yeah, well, trying to fight for top of the mountain is a continuous theme. And unfortunately, it seems to be a theme that reaches the outer regions. You know, I mean, that brings the idea of, um, you know, in our culture, our cultures, you know, it's always about who can get to the top, who can reach the highest, who can be the best, who can get the most. And um, how, how tied in with that is, is anger, is trying to be the best mean that we have to destroy others on the way up there? I don't know, it's just a thought. Stephen, did you have any thoughts? No, I think, I think it's a beautiful sutta. I think it's one worth revisiting a lot for our own practice. It's inspiring. It's easy perhaps to kind of start to read into it things that we want to, to try to maybe find loopholes for anger. Like, well, you know, if somebody's brought in chains and I really don't worry about him, well, it's easy not to be angry. You know, it might be more angry if he was not brought in in chains and I thought he might be coming at me. But we, of course, have to trust Sukkah's sincerity and his wisdom, that he's not just saying that because, you know, it's easy, but in fact, he, he practices what he preaches and it's possible. And so I think that's the thing for me, that it's a goal that is possible and I need to constantly remind myself of that. Right. Um, yeah. And, oh, there was something, oh, just just one more thing in regards to patience. I did want to say that, you know, in this patience, that doesn't mean that we act like we're patient as if we're speaking to a bratty child or what have you. It's it's true patience, meaning it's true, a true feeling of um, there's no animosity there. In other words, maybe, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you act like you're being patient with someone, but really it's kind of like this, um, um, sneering superior way. It's not that. It's like the actual feeling of patience. So just just wanted to bring that up in terms of, of loopholes. And so, yeah, it's, it's great. I'm glad. I don't know if you noticed, but we are moving to a phase of solutions here, um, which is nice. We're not just talking about the, the rage effect. We're, we're talking about what we can do to not have, you know, so much anger in our lives. And I'm hoping that, you know, you're able to apply some of these things and maybe even memorize some of these stanzas or lines um, so they can be helpful to you um, when you're not angry and, and prepare you for when those situations inevitably come up. And I want to thank you all for being here with us tonight.
And I'm looking forward to seeing you all, um, hopefully, next Thursday. So have a beautiful, beautiful morning and a beautiful evening, everyone. And thank you. 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 Thank happy you. Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh, happy yeah. Lunar yes. New Year. Yes. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Yeah.